welcome your host for this evening, Dr. Lindsay Hoffman. Hello, good evening, everyone. It's great to welcome you to the 12th annual National Agenda Speaker Series here at Gore Recital Hall at the University of Delaware. I'm also pleased to welcome our virtual audience, those who are live streaming, uh, as well as those at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, one of the earliest and largest lifelong learning programs in the country for adults 50 and over. We're here thanks to UD's Center for Political Communication, as well as the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you for your support. This year's theme is politics by the numbers. So we're talking about polling, we're talking about all kinds of things related to uh, midterm elections. And you might be wondering why tonight we're talking about listening as part of politics by the numbers. But I think you'll discover that a lot of Americans are really divided by uh, party and by other issues and Sometimes it just comes down to learning how to listen to each other. So as usual, we will be inviting uh, audience participation, but I'd like to remind our audience that civil di dialogue is vital to the success of national agenda. So let's agree to be candid, but also courteous of each other's views. When I open it up for Q&A around 8.30, simply raise your hand and I'll ask our student volunteers to bring the microphone to you, then direct you back to your seat. We will also field questions both in-house and from the OSHA students during the Q&A at the end of this conversation. So I'll be keeping my eye up on the booth to see if there are questions coming in from the Zoom meeting. Tonight, did you know that according to a September 2019 Pew research poll of nearly 10,000 Americans, most people agree that they disagree with each other? In fact, 73% of the public not only disagrees over plans and policies, but also cannot agree on the basic facts. And that was pre-COVID. <laughs> As the founder and CEO of the Listen Per First Project, Pierce Godwin is working to reverse extreme partisanship and demonization across differences. Described as a national voice for bridging divides in America, Godwin founded the Listen First Project in 2013. His organization has now built a coalition of more than 400 organizations, including retail and mass media corporations, as well as universities. The Listen First Project and its partners have hosted thousands of conversations through the annual America Talks and National Week of Conversation, reaching more than 50 million people. Godwin has even testified before Congress about civil discourse. He writes for USA Today, has been interviewed by Fox News, MSNBC, PBS, and Wall Street Journal. After graduating from Duke University in North Carolina, he spent five years working in the U.S. Senate and as a national political consultant, then earned an MBA from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in 2018. You can talk to him about the Duke-UNC thing later if you want. Uh, please welcome to the stage uh, the Listen First Project's founder and CEO. Please give him a big blue hen welcome, Pierce Godwin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you for having me. So I know you want to give a little bit of a talk before we get into our conversation, so have at it. All right. So on a recent cross-country road trip, uh, I repeatedly encountered the breathtaking beauty and the majesty of the place that we call home, the peaks and the plains of these United States, awaken my patriotism, you know, the personal pain and the national fear that today seems so prevalent seemed then kind of far away. But I know that for many of us, it's hitting close to home. That this toxic polarization, the way we demonize each other across differences, is causing breakdown from the dinner table to family vacations, from worship services to workplaces, perhaps even here at UD as well. So let me ask you all a couple questions that we posed in a recent national survey. When you talk about issues in society with people with whom you disagree, which of the following is closest to how you generally find the experience to be? Your options are gonna be interesting and informative, stressful and frustrating, or boring and pointless. For whom do you find these experiences to be interesting and informative? All right, how about stressful and frustrating? Mm -hmm. no, Don't ooh. be shy. <laughs> Boring and pointless. Yeah. So a lot of stress and frustration. Nationally, 54% told us that they find those kind of conversations stressful and frustrating. 
One more. When discussing issues with people with whom you disagree, do you generally find that others are opening, open to listening to your views or quick to attack them? Who often finds that folks are open to listening to your views? No hands are raised. Seems we're in trouble. <laughs> One all right, hand. <laughs> all right. Great experiences back there. How about quick to attack them? Who's run into that? Wow. Job security. Nationally, 66% said that folks are quick to attack them. This is politics by the numbers, so let me give you a few more. 62% of Americans today say that the political climate is preventing them from saying what they believe. That's some of y'all, as I have, have censured yourselves in that way. 32% say the division has made it difficult to get along with friends or family. It doesn't feel good to lose family, friends, loved ones, neighbors, because we see the world differently, doesn't matter what side you're on. Now, even as I was on that cross-country road trip and transfixed by America's natural beauty, I did find the serenity punctured a number of times by antagonistic signs. There was one on a tree, on a truck, in the middle of a field. Now, unlike the many flags I saw proclaiming love of country, these particular signs proclaimed what their owners were against. They were beacons of fear instead of hope, hate instead of love, judgment instead of grace. It really struck me how sad, juxtaposed against that beauty, the state of our union is today. Abraham Lincoln, quoting Jesus, said, A house divided against itself cannot stand. They weren't playing. More than half of us, 54%, now say that our fellow Americans pose the greatest risk to the country. This toxic polarization has been described as a singularly virulent and dangerous phenomenon, as our greatest national security vulnerability. Nearly all of us, including I think most everyone in this room, recognize the threat. 87% say they do. 71% in my humble opinion, rightly conclude that our democracy itself is in danger. 35% of partisans now believe that violence could be justified to advance their political goals. 61% say they're concerned that we could face another civil war in this country. 43% believe it's at least somewhat likely in the next decade. And 14% of our fellow Americans I think it's very likely that in the next 10 years, we'll see another civil war, brother against brother, sister against sister. Today, they, of course, are our enemies. They are a serious threat. They are downright evil. One of the ways we measure this affective polarization is with a 100-point so-called feeling thermometer. This thing is deployed every four years by the American National Election Studies and also by Pew and other researchers. Let's take a little walk through history. In 1978, Democrats rated Republicans a 48 on a 0 to 100 point scale. Republicans rated Democrats a 46. All right, we're around the midpoint, 0 to 100, not so bad. Even as recently as 2000, Democrats still rated Republicans a 41. Republicans rated Democrats a 38. Getting a little chilly, you might need a jacket, but like, we're all right. Most recently, in 2000, ratings from both sides had plummeted halfway to zero, just over those two decades. Democrats rated Republicans a 20. Republicans rated Democrats a 16. Now it's time for the ski gear. 48% of Republicans gave Democrats a zero out of 100 in terms of their warmth or coldness, as it were, towards those people. That's a 600% increase since 2000. The other side of the coin isn't much prettier. 39% of Democrats gave Republicans a zero, a 300% increase from 2000. One in five Americans say that many members of the other side, quote, lack the traits to be considered fully human. I mean, we've heard the word dehumanization, but... Wow. And 15% of Republicans and 20% of Democrats say the country would be better off if large numbers of those people just died. Just died? Like, for real? 
We've got to get a grip on ourselves. When is the last time that murderous rage turned out well for anybody? Experts who've witnessed sectarian violence break out in countries around the world are sounding the alarm right here at home. What for many of them is their own backyard where they never thought they need to apply their expertise. They're begging us to grasp what our once exceptional nation could soon become. And the danger, of course, as you all have demonstrated, is not lost on the American people. Americans across party lines and demographic groups recently say that division in the country is the most important issue facing them personally. And in another poll, they ranked uniting the country as the most important national priority. Yet, as warning signs about toxic polarization and calls for reconciliation grow louder, I keep hearing people say, all right, but oh, hell no, not with them. I've got a line, not those fellow, fellow Americans, not those people. There is this massive amount of distrust, of fear, of contempt that is coursing through our American veins. And I get it. That distrust, that fear, that contempt can make the very idea of engaging with those people really distasteful and even disloyal to our own tribe, to our own people, to our own values, and what in fancy talk is called our in-group. But to those who reject the idea of engaging across differences, I just have an earnest question. What is your solution? What is your end game? All right, let's play out this scenario where I'm saying, oh, hell no, not with them. And I've actually gotten some answers, which conveniently, because I love alliteration, fit four Ds. Delusion, doom, duck, and dash. Many of us behave as if one day that somehow we're just going to vanquish those people and their ideas. All right? It's going to be bliss. We're just not going to have to contend with them. They're just going to poof, somehow be gone. Um, with all due respect, in these United States, I find that delusional. Those people aren't going anywhere. Others have given up hope and think that we're, as we just looked at, irrevocably destined for another civil war. That's doom to me. Some have forsaken civic engagement of any kind and kind of just secluded themselves with those closest to us, with our friends and with our families, because all that I can't handle. We're ducking. We're ducking down. We're disengaging. And then finally, I keep running into people who, no joke, like have a plan to leave the United States. Like they've picked out their place. They got a plan. They've talked about it with their loved ones. They are ready to dash. We're in big trouble. But... I'm here to tell you that there is hope. Hope is found in Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs crossing their lines of difference. To spend a little time together, to see humanity in each other, to identify shared values, and then to work together to fix things they broadly agree are broken. All those things that whatever your perspective, whatever your passion, are stuck right now because of this toxic polarization. Now, the muscle memory that we've all practiced and gotten so good at of pointing our fingers out to blame them, picking up my thems in the audience, is so strong. But there's only one actor in the American story who I can control. I dare say that the same may be true for each of you as well. It's myself. We Americans at our best are not passive. We're not weak victims, helpless to determine our fate. No, we are free. We are empowered. We are heroes in the arc of history that must bend towards our nation's founding ideals and promise. Now, if today I'm a little too optimistic, if that's not who we are, if we're too angry, too afraid to turn down the heat and find a way forward together, America will fail. I mean, it's just that simple. The experiment doesn't work when we're at war against ourselves. And we'll have no one to blame but ourselves. Now, of course, in case it's not already clear, 
Uh, Our elected leaders are not going to lead the way out of this. As I heard in church once, salvation will not arrive on Air Force One. We, the people, have an urgent choice to make. Are we going to continue fighting against our fellow Americans? Or are we going to fight for America? Are we going to continue fighting? Or are we going to fight back against social media and politicians dividing us? Are we going to take our power back as the people, as one team? My friends at Beyond Conflict identify the quality of social relations as the number one driver of sustainable peace. These are some of the folks I was talking about who have spent their whole careers in those places where we see it hit the fan, and now they're seeing it here. They point to the norms and structures shaping the dialogue environment as a key factor. Now, we can all agree, got a lot of politicos in the audience, that our democratic republic requires some basic level of trust in and acceptance of those different from ourselves. It thrives when, despite our differences, we feel that we're in it together, that each of us belong. When our shared identity as Americans is superordinate, rises above, transcends those competing tribal identities. Now, on the other hand, When this affective polarization escalates to sectarianism, our democratic republic, as I would argue it is now, is in peril. So I'm with the 79% of Americans who tell us that creating more opportunities for people to talk with those that have different values and views would be effective in reducing divisiveness. That's why I'm here. It's called contact theory. 42% say they're up for joining a conversation with another American of different beliefs. And I love this one, that when they're assured that they'll actually be listened to respectfully, Americans are four times more likely to say, yeah, I can do that. I can come together with somebody who might think different or look different than I do. Listening with curiosity is the key, in my mind, to a successful conversation across difference. Thus, the name, the mantra, and the hashtag of our Listen First Coalition, of organizations who are bringing Americans together across differences. In July 2013, I was on an overnight bus ride across Africa after spending six months there on development projects. After years in Washington, D.C., as you heard, when I was working on the Hill or working on voter micro-targeting for national campaigns, I'd gone over there to get a fresh perspective on life. I didn't expect to get such a fresh perspective on America. I was deeply troubled by news that this most materially prosperous nation in the world was being gripped by relational poverty, exactly the opposite of what I experienced in that other part of the world. So unable to sleep, all stirred up on this bus ride, I wrote what I thought was a blog post. It was called, It's Time to Listen. That message ended up being printed in dozens of major newspapers across the United States and ultimately launched Listen First Project. Importantly, I soon discovered that it wasn't just little old me in Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina, that even back in the quaint days of 2013 was concerned about this. There are a lot of efforts to bring people together across differences. I like having friends and believe that the best way to make an impact was by working together. So I launched the Listen First Coalition with four organizations in 2017, and today they're 500. The coalition is organizations that bring Americans together across differences to listen, to understand each other, and to discover common interest. Some of those organizations focus on dialogue around personal experiences to build relationships, while others focus on deliberation on particular issues. Some work in local communities, while others engage Americans coast to coast. Some convene Americans in person, while others especially recently, convened virtually. Some engage a broad audience, while others, like some that you all are working with, target particular populations, such as students, policymakers, people of faith, or other segments. Some engage everyday Americans directly, while others have high-profile conversations and produce multimedia to model for and inspire the rest of us. Finally, some engage via conversations, while others get to work, When I was talking about fixing things we agree are broken, they're working on tangible projects together. 
In 2018, that one small Listen First coalition came alive by co-creating the first annual National Week of Conversation. The coalition has powered NWOC, as we call it, every year since, now five annually. And it kicks off, as was mentioned, with a galvanizing event called America Talks in partnership with USA Today and other partners. Now, things are getting bad, quick, so we're trying to speed up our own mission to ultimately engage millions of Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs to turn down the heat and find a way forward together. I'm now working on a project called Meeting of America, which as I've discussed with some of you all, is piloting in the central and eastern Kentucky area. After months of executing a quiet, relationship-driven, trust-building ground game to ensure balanced representation, which, got to be honest, doesn't typically exist um, in this work of bringing others together across differences, we spent that time to build trust. We're also skeptical, aren't we? We're looking for the agenda. We're looking for why, but what and who is really behind this? It takes time. I told y'all earlier, trust doesn't scale. I've been trying all year to speed it up. Spoiler alert, you can't. Building those relationships to gain the trust, even to get over that fear and have a little bit of courage to come to the conversation is required. So we've been focused on the ground game, and now we've just launched the air game, as I like to call it, with a press conference with mayors and other local leaders. The earned media, thankfully, has exceeded our expectations. Every local television station covered it. It turns out you don't really have to convince anybody of the problem these days. We all feel it. As I said, it's hitting close to home. We're partnering with local baseball teams. We've got billboards and bus ads and radio ads. We're trying to hit that surround sound marketing so that those of us who are feeling the personal pain or the national fear understand that there is a way out. Meeting of America would be the first opportunity to achieve scale and balance to achieve the mission that the bridging field has been working on for so long. We're building on everything that my many partners have learned over decades of work. It's serving as well as the ultimate laboratory for this bridging, where we're testing, we're refining, we're measuring what is happening, if it works, and how it works best. We forge partnerships with some of America's most influential brands, from Walmart to Target to McDonald's, Harley Davidson, Boston Beer, Dick's Sporting Goods, iHeartMedia. A few more numbers, since this is politics by the numbers, on how it works. Scientific measurement of the impact on those hundreds of pilot participants found particularly strong improvement on affective polarization. That's simply dislike of those other people, on anger and on empathy. 100% of participants told us that they felt heard. 82% said it made them more interested in having conversations across differences. 86% wanted to be part of the ongoing community working together to fix what's broken. This one's my favorite. 79% of the pilot participants said it gave them more hope for America. And 97% were excited to invite others to participate. We're executing now a goals and measures program for the bridging movement out of Listen First Project. We're focused on field capacity, strengthening this field, mobilization, mobilizing target sectors and audiences, building up all the way to societal health where we can shift those social norms, because that, as we talked about earlier, is what can truly scale. Two-thirds of Americans do still agree that in the end, we're all Americans. And three-quarters believe that it is still possible for the U.S. to achieve the ideal of our national motto, e pluribus unum, from many people, one. But we've got to match that hope with action before it's too late. America's warning lights are blinking red. The question now is, what will you do about it? Thankfully, 79% say that given the opportunity, they would play a part in reducing social division in America. Will you? As I said earlier, I think we each have an urgent choice to make with nothing short of our society and our country on the line. Will we continue fighting against our fellow Americans or will we fight for America? 
Will you show up for each other and for the country we love? It starts with bringing your voice to the conversation and listening. Thanks for doing so tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, you talked about all this personal experience we all have. We had a great class meeting today, a great dinner with students about how we've all encountered this situation where we've been with people who disagree with us and who might discount us. Um, I have a couple questions for my students uh, today about your personal experience and how you came to this, this place that you are. Do you think that this, uh, Megan asked, do you think that this lack of listening we're facing in America today has always been present? And if not, what do you consider, I like this wording, the beginning of the end of listening? Ooh, that's good. I told someone earlier that there are more explanations for this problem than you can shake a stick at. I mean, like, a hundred different ones. Um, the thing is, they're all right. Um, but none of them are the whole problem. As we saw from that data, data from the feeling thermometer, from Pew and others, the last 20 years have been really, really rough. Um, there's so many things that have happened that I think have thrown us all uh, a little off kilter, uh, led us all to grasp for some sort of security, some sort of belonging, that which for millennia us humans have, have deeply desired. Uh, the problem is that for so many reasons, of course, the easy ones are our social media, but you also have this polarization of the parties themselves in which our ideology within party has really become strictly aligned and homogeneous. You used to have both at the elected official level and with us as voters, not uncommon at all for folks to have some views that might fit in this camp and other views that, that fit in that camp. But as uh, the toxicity, as the demonization, as that fear and feeling of threat has increased, as some of us were talking about walking over here, I might not actually believe all the things that my side believes, but now sticking with and being loyal to my side, it seems in many cases is more important than my own individual and natural ideological beliefs. Another fun one, again, there's so many explanations, but, but one the, that I like because I think it's an example of unintended consequences. If you look at the level of, of Congress, when Speaker Newt Gingrich came in in 1994 in what's called the Republican Revolution, he had the idea that members of Congress ought to spend more time in their districts. Makes sense to me. Let's spend more time with the people and less time in Washington um, being away from our constituents. Uh, but what I, I would assume was an unintended consequence is that the folks serving us in Washington today, they don't know each other. Their kids aren't on soccer teams together. Their partners aren't going out and having dinner together. Like, they honestly don't know each other. And there's a great quote about how hard it is to hate up close. So if I'm on the other side of the aisle or on the other side of, you know, the warring screens on cable news, I can vilify the mess out of you because I don't know you. I don't know your family. I'm just going to go ahead and demonize you. Uh, so that's just one example for our elected officials uh, of the lack of relationships. You've also got, you know, geographic segregation. The big sort, you know, book was back in the 90s. But that idea that it's increasingly likely that I am living and working um, and, and, and just spending all my time around people who are probably of my generally same background and belief. All those things have compounded. And again, just because it's a cliche when I want to skip over social media, certainly that has ratcheted up um, the temperature and allowed us to say things that, God help us, I hope we never say face to face with somebody, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that has all just gotten us to a fever pitch that has stirred us up in a positive feedback loop going in the wrong direction. And, you know, from people a lot smarter than I am uh, in this space who have done this work overseas, um, you know, I, I, I'm certainly striking notes of hope, but something has got to break us out of this. And the question and the fear is how bad does it have to get before enough of us say, that's it. Somebody had a great saying for it earlier today, like, when are we going to put our shovels down and stop digging the hole. Mm -hmm. I think it'll happen because, again, this just doesn't feel good mm -hmm. to any of us. 
Um, but it hasn't happened yet. One more thing. Listen, first guy likes to talk. One, <laughs> one more thing. Uh, what we found. I thought over, we talked about the value of shut up and listen. Right? Shut up. And, we, we, we have some nominations for that. Right. Um, but uh, w- one more thing. The times we've seen uh, America kind of rally around together had been times of external threat, right? Times of war. I don't care what you think about President George W. Bush, right after 9 11, the man's approval rating hit 91% in Gallup. Mm-hmm. How unfathomable is that today? We rallied together. One might say that the pandemic gave us that opportunity, right? It was an external threat. That's not exactly how that played out, in case you haven't uh, been paying attention. <laughs> um, but re- really kind of depressing because that was an opportunity. That was an opportunity mm-hmm. for us to, to rally together. So I hope it doesn't take war but historically, that is the kind of thing, it's called asteroid theory, John Height's idea, that when there's an asteroid coming, I don't care who you voted for. We are shoulder to shoulder, and we are trying to survive this thing together. And, and we'll come back to 9-11 and, and COVID for sure, and social media. I really want to spend mm-hmm. some time on that. But I want to uh, point to, uh, there's a, a graph I just pulled up from, also from the Pew Research Center, um, that demonstrates how the parties have increasingly identified over the past two decades in particular have held very unfavorable, hateful positions Mm -hmm. towards the other party. And uh, we have an increasing media environment where people are falling into echo chambers. They're listening to people who only think like themselves. Um, If you give me a moment, I'm just going to talk about a few uh, instances of violence. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lauren, one of my students, pointed out that toxic polarization has led to increased violence in the U.S. Just over a week ago, a 53-year-old Michigan man shot and murdered his wife and their dog as a result of falling down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole uh, from, from QAnon. His 25-year-old daughter was also injured in the shooting. A December poll by NPR and Ipsos found that 17% of Americans believe the core falsehood of QAnon that, this is a quote, a group of Satan-worshipping elites who run a child sex ring are trying to control our politics and media was true. And then we just had over the weekend former President Trump uh, appearing in uh, my, one of my home states of Ohio in Youngstown playing a song at a political rally that prompted attendees to respond with a salute in reference to the cult-like QAnon conspiracy theories theme song. He delivered a dark address about the decline of America, music that was all but identical to a song called WWG1WGA, which maybe you can elaborate on what that is. It's an abbreviation from the QAnon slogan, where we go one, we go all. As Mr. Trump spoke, scores of people in the crowd raised their fingers in the air in an apparent reference to the one in what they thought was the song's title. I'm not going to use that gesture, but I think you can imagine what that looks like when people are all pointing their hands up in a direction with the, their first finger. My question for you, and a lot of students had this question too, is how do you listen to people who wholeheartedly believe conspiracy theories like QAnon? People who believe that some politicians are actually lizards designed, disguised as human beings. Shouldn't there be some ground rules for listening across these divides? Each one of the people that holds beliefs that we may find loony, abhorrent, whatever, uh, they're our fellow Americans. They're a human. And that's where I would start. Um, I've had really interesting conversations I shared with with y'all just recently um, and some folks who uh, believe uh, some of of those things, some tenets of, of what's broadly characterized as the QAnon belief system. I'm talking to someone who is a part of my family, and, and, and honestly, I, I was really trying to practice what I preach. And, and really, as, as some of us were talking about, extend grace and not judgment, and be genuinely curious. Um, and I learned a lot. It, it, it truly gave me um, a tremendous degree of, of empathy and understanding, um, even if it's not something that I would agree with. And in that particular case, uh, the, the person said, you know, I was never that political. I was never looking into this kind of thing. And then COVID hit, and I just felt my freedoms being taken away. I just didn't really like how the government was telling me that I needed to wear a mask or how my employer was telling me that I needed to get a vaccine. 
Now, some of us may have different views and, and not necessarily follow or relate to where that path led for that individual, but gosh, you feel like you're losing your freedoms? That's scary. That's something I think we can relate to. That's something I think we can begin to have a conversation about. And taking it out of that anecdote and more towards the aggregate, you know, I want to be honest and and true and have integrity in extending that grace, in listening with curiosity, in connecting with respect. But even if that's asking too much, I'll go back to my four Ds, it's math, right? We're in a United States that, call it what you like, melting pot, salad bowl, whatever, Um, I personally think it's awesome, and it is truly exceptional when you look around the world at the kind of different backgrounds that are represented here, and oh, by the way, it's never really been tried before. I don't have to get all the way into the data, but, you know, where a democracy goes from a majority becoming a minority, it's literally never happened. No wonder we're having such a hard time. So the the greatness of the experiment of this country makes it really freaking hard (laughs) to do it, right, for this pluralism thing to work. But again, with my friends uh, for whom, and trust me, I get it, um, who, whatever, and there's, there's examples across the board, but like that thing feels beyond the pale. That thing I can't entertain. I can't, you know, cater or in any way validate that by even having a conversation. Like, sorry to be trite, but good luck with that. Because the whole point of some of the data that Doc Hoff over here has shared is that it's not a tiny share of our fellow Americans. It is not a a small share. And again, I'm not picking on the group, you know, you raised or any other group. I'm just saying if there were a a really small percentage of our Americans who, you know, in some, like none of us can be objective, but let's just, you know, stick with me. If we could genuinely identify some finite, very carefully, would never happen, stick with me, very carefully uh, identified people who are like truly malicious, like they really are out to destroy this country, they really are bad actors, and that's like a few percentage points, all right, there might be a conversation to be had about, uh, uh, about, you know, thriving as a society um, without the, the active engagement of those fellow Americans, but across the board, again, not just the group that we started with here, but plenty of other groups that other, that other you know, Americans would point to as examples of the violence, as examples of the vitriol. They're all way too big <laughs> for us to marginalize. They're all way too big for us to write off. It won't work. So whether it's kind of the, the principle um, and, and of of, uh, you know, if you want to go to a, to a Christian background of loving your neighbor like yourself, of treating others like you want to be treated, whether that or whether it's just pragmatism that we can't, I loved telling uh, my friends who, you know, loathe the former president um, when he was in office, we don't mend the fade fabric of America with the 60% who don't support President Trump. It's not how math works. You don't have to agree with people, but those are our fellow Americans. Those are humans, and we've got to move forward together. So it's about finding some common ground. Make it personal. Make it about their values, their hopes, their fears, their aspirations. Not about positions. Get past the talking points. What's your story? And you tell yours and in so that conversation. Give us your, you, you give us some three really critical uh, strategies for talking across differences, Mm -hmm. particularly across differences that I know a lot of my students are like, well, how can I talk to someone who I can, they're just not looking at truth, they're not looking at fact. What are some ways that you can help them to be open to having these conversations Mm -hmm. and letting people who may be down a rabbit hole and so far in that they're they're not talking to anyone who has disagreeing opinions? Mm -hmm. What are those three core principles you talked about with us today? Yeah. My, my three favorites um, of everything I've seen boil down to listen with curiosity, speak from your own experience, and connect with respect. I think that really covers it. How am I going to listen? 
going to be with curiosity, not with judgment, not with, you know, seven habits of highly effective people to understand, not to respond. How am I going to speak? That's what I was just talking about from my own experience, because that's how we get out of the food fight. That's how we have an actual human connection instead of repping and warring on behalf of the tribe, the community that we feel a part of. And finally, we're going to connect with respect. And to the point of, you know, seeing folks who, in our mind, maybe don't look at truth, don't look at facts, they're down a rabbit hole, well, don't talk about truth and facts. Talk about who that person is. What are their values? What are their life experiences? And again, I I like to kind of give both the um, pure and uh, honorable and noble, if I myself could, could be that noble, um, my girlfriend would be happier. But, but we all want to try to be that. But you can also just look at it practically. I told y'all that coming at people, we've experienced this, with facts and figures, spoiler alert, no. it doesn't no. work. No. It's called backfire effects. You come at me like that, I am digging my heels in. You're not persuading me of anything. So whether it's because you actually want to be effective and not waste your time, or because you truly do see the dignity in that fellow American, make it personal, make it human. I think that's terrific advice. And I think that um, sometimes we see each other as these ideologues when we're all really just human beings who are trying to figure this whole thing out that we're in. Um, We're going to switch to an open Q&A in uh, about 15 minutes. Um, We're going to start with the audience here in the Gore Recital Hall at the Roselle Center for the Arts here at University of Delaware. But we do, as I mentioned, have uh, this community at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute that I'm hoping will zoom some questions in. I'll be looking for our production booth for questions from them. But I think I really want to discuss um, what's happening in Washington, D.C. and what's happening um, specifically in the White House. Uh, President Biden held a summit to discuss violence and hate in the country last week. Some voters say he's come up short on his pledge to try to heal, as he described it, the soul of the nation. According to one of our previous National Agenda speakers, NPR White House correspondent Asma Khalid, shout out to Asma. Um, So a couple of questions. One comes from Kelly. I'll give you a two-parter. Do you feel that the Biden administration has made any progress in bridging the gaps between Democrats and Republicans? And what advice would you have for this UD alum, this fighting blue hen that is now the president in the White House? I don't know President Biden personally. Um, I've watched him over the years. And uh, my own you know, personal impression has been that you know, he is a man who wants to find a way forward, right? When he was vice president, he was always the one deployed to negotiate with Mitch McConnell. Um, again, I, I don't know him, uh, but, but I have always taken at face value that he's somebody uh, who wants to find common ground, who would rather not demonize um, folks, who would rather see the humanity. So I, I've got to admit, I'm extremely disappointed in President Biden right now. We've had leaders who didn't seem to even care about unifying the country, wasn't a priority to them, and I understand that. We've had leaders who uh, seem to really lean into a strategy of fomenting our most base instincts and turning us against each other. Uh, But with President Biden, I thought we might um, have somebody uh, in office who would really follow through on that campaign pledge and his refrain to heal the soul of the nation. Um, And unfortunately, especially in recent weeks, uh, I've seen the president talk on the one hand about healing the soul of the nation and then in the very next breath or tweet say that those people, which we've talked about the stats, he's not talking about a couple people, he's talking about a massive share of our fellow Americans. And you're referring to MAGA. What he calls MAGA Republicans. Mm -hmm. Right. That that MAGA Republicans are, quote, in his tweet, a threat to the very soul of the country. Something's not connecting for me there. I don't see how you heal the soul of the nation by dividing us against each other. So I'm I'm very disappointed. I I had some hope. um, And the president's rhetoric in recent weeks, even while holding a summit that 
and part of its title was United We Stand, uh, has delivered remarks that seem the very antithesis of healing the soul of the nation, of bridging divides. And that's why, as I said, it's up to us. Our leaders have a lot of incentives. They have a lot of voices in their ears. Even if a person at their core and in their heart wants to be one way, there are things about our system um, and the environment right now that compel far too many of them to choose a different direction, to choose what I believe is a destructive direction, and I regret that he seems to have done that. But if you had uh, President Biden's ear, if you were, if, pretend I'm Joe Biden sitting here, which I think he probably has sat here at some point uh, in his uh, career at University of Delaware, um, what's one or two pieces of advice you might offer to say how we can get away from the divides and bring people together? There is such an appetite right now for a way out, right? There is such an appetite to get out of this toxicity, to get out of demonizing each other across differences. So it's easy to think that, well, you know, it's, it's principle and, and heart and best intentions versus politics. Well, to win, and look, I'm not naive. I worked in Washington for five years. I am pretty naive, but I still worked in Washington for five years. And it's true that pitting us against each other, creating contrast between candidates, between fellow Americans, has proven to be effective in many ways. But right now, we're all so freaking tired of it. I believe that not only could we evoke the better angels of our nature, as President Biden has, has sought to do in a number of his speeches over the years, not only do I think that's the only way this country survives, but I think there's a real constituency for it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real constituency for a candidate who refuses to stay in that toxic cycle, in that doom loop, and says, you know what? I'm going to be different. Now, when I'll really be impressed is when a candidate does that, even if it does cost them politically. Mm -hmm. Because perhaps the future of this nation and the American experiment is more important than the next election. Well, let me talk a little bit about, we've got some good questions uh, related to the structure of American democracy, um, thinking about the two-party system. So Anna had a question that says, do you believe that the two-party system that rules American politics is partially responsible for the division that we see today? And then I'm gonna follow up with a question from Megan that is, is partisanship profitable? Is listening first and bridging, bridging divides <laughs> possible in a capitalist democracy, or does our system encourage this divisiveness and polarization? Great questions. <laughs> um, where'd you find Please these? answer where'd those. Where'd you find these students? <laughs> uh, um, Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly, I think things about our political structure. We talked a little bit over dinner about the, you know, using fancy poli-sci language, kind of the first past the poll voting, the single member districts, the primaries, who of course, look, we mentioned earlier, all these people are human. Like, I'm not going to stand here and castigate those people in Washington. Like, I'm looking in the mirror, mm -hmm. and I would encourage all of us to look in the mirror. So they are operating with the incentives of their system. Politicians are a survivalist species. I get that. I actually have a lot of, of empathy for that. I think, still, a lot of folks are there for the right reasons. Um, uh, but I do think that, that the system, the fact that uh, in 92% of our congressional districts these days, there is nothing to worry about in the general election, unless you're Eric Cantor and maybe shouldn't have been having a steak dinner that night instead of campaigning. But anyway, um, unless in very rare cases, like the primary is what matters, and that is going to pull us towards the interest of those voters. Because the most extremely partisan voters vote in the primary. Exactly. And, and, and a narrower slice of the electorate. So it is just further and further polarizing. But to the point, uh, I absolutely think that, that some reforms, such as you know, ones some of my friends advocate for, whether it's ranked choice voting or multi-member districts or things around the influence of money in politics, I think these are all important. I do think they would make a big difference. I am a conservative and am all about the free market and competition. And for those reasons, 
Love it. Love some of these ideas. Again, I keep going with y'all to the practical. As long as we're this toxically divided, I don't see too many of those kind of reforms passing because sometimes in the short term, it seems it would favor Republicans, sometimes Democrats. Regardless, those who feel that they would be hurt in the short term by these kind of reforms are going to, you know, block and, and, and resist tooth and nail. So do I think it would help? Absolutely. Do I think it's the whole answer? No. Do I think it'll happen anytime soon? Unfortunately not until we are able to take that longer view or able to have that perspective and not be so convinced that if our side loses the next election, all is lost for our culture, for our values, for our family, everything. That existential threat makes those kind of longer term systemic reforms darn near impossible. So your call is, is not necessarily on our legislators or our elected representatives because they're going to fall subject to the, the system itself, but to us as citizens to learn better ways for communicating with each other and listening to each other. All right. Lovely. I have two other topics. I have many topics I wanted to talk to you about, <laughs> but two that I want to get to before we open it up for our Q&A. Um, first is about... Um, campus climate and, mm -hmm. and conversations on the campus. And the second one I want to get to is how technology and misinformation uh, transmitted through technology has added to this uh, problem. So uh, first I'll start with um, uh, Kate, just a very general question. Uh, my student Kate asks, how can we as undergrads in college begin to bridge differences on our campus? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, uh, let me first make sure I, I honor one of the earlier questions uh, that was posed in terms of, is it possible? Is it profitable? Right? I want to touch on that briefly. Um, big fan of business. You know, I, I like economics. I'm into that kind of thing. I'm into the market. Guess what's profitable? What we demand, right? So whether we're talking about our elected leaders or our cable news executives or anybody else that have been called the entrepreneurs of division or the division profiteers. These people are responding to us. They're not stupid. They're responding to the incentives we give them. Many of them aren't even malicious. They're responding to the incentives we give them. So do I think it's possible? Yeah, if we the consumers change our demand. Now, uh, on campus, so many uh, partners in our Listen First Coalition focus on campus. We've already talked tonight about Bridge USA, about Braver Angels, about free intelligent conversations, uh, doing incredible work. If you can engage with one of those groups, terrific, wonderful. It's not required. Totally endorse it. Like, by all means, start a chapter of your favorite student-focused in initiative that is Bridging Divides. But you don't need to be a part of an organization to listen with curiosity, to speak from your own experience, and to connect with respect. Let's practice it. And y'all, I'm not like trying to make this sound easy. It is scarier and harder every single day. But that's why we got to start now. So I would encourage you to step outside that comfort zone. You say, you know what? That person in class or that person um, in my residence hall is somebody who I may not see eye to eye with. They seem like they're coming from a different place. Let me get to know them. Like, let's work on that muscle, right? I talked about the muscle that goes like this. Woo, that muscle is ready to roll. Damn, damn. That is ready to roll, the abominable those people. Um, let's practice some other muscles. And uh, I, I'll throw in you know, a fun quote that never doubt that a few people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So do it where you are in our own little small spaces. Let's set a different tone and let the ripples flow out and see if we can't set a different tone for the country at large. Well, in building on that, uh, I'll wrap up with a question about technology. 33% of TikTok users now say they regularly get their news on that social, on that app, up from just 22% two years ago. Um, meanwhile, nearly every other social media site saw declines across the same metric. This also comes from Pew Research Center. I'm a big fan. Um, same. <laughs> It, Facebook, were now only 44% of its users report really getting their news from there, down from 54% just two years ago. The age group most likely to get news from TikTok 
is 18 to 29 year olds. What advice do you have for this age group as they navigate the complex media landscape, especially as they're looking for news on apps like TikTok in a couple minutes? Yeah. Um, we've got to burst our bubbles and get outside of our echo chambers, if at all possible. And look, we're busy. I don't practice what I preach on this nearly as well as I should, but there's some great tools out there. My friends at All Sides do an incredible job of curating stuff from the left, right, and center. Get those perspectives, even if it's just tapping a couple different um, uh, icons on your phone. I don't need to tell you who's right and who's left, but, but especially when, when big stuff's happening, I really do like um, going to my Fox News app versus my CNN app versus my MSNBC app. Same thing with papers. Um, that's, that's what you got to do um, is, is expose yourself um, to a perspective that is not necessarily validating what you already believe. I like being validated as much as the next person. Um, but if we're watching something or consuming something that is just making us go, yeah, yeah, their fault, their fault, Maybe there's another side to the story. Maybe there's some perspective that we're missing, and I wish it weren't this way. I wish our media and our technology ecosystem wasn't so balkanized, but it is, and so it becomes incumbent on us to challenge our thinking, to complicate the narrative, as Amanda Ripley says, um, and to not just kind of allow ourselves to be spoon-fed and accept uncritically um, the information we're given especially if it's telling us to hate those people. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, let's see. I want to, I think I, my next slide is, yes, National Week of Conversation. This is in April, typically. Um, yes, ma'am. We had our fifth year uh, this earlier this April. I was one of the participants on our campus. We engaged in free intelligent conversations uh, on this campus. Um, please visit cpc.udel.edu to hear more about all these initiatives uh, that, that Pierce has talked about. But what is, when, when are we going to see National Week of Conversation in 2023? Um, and where can people go to engage in this conversation? So that's the question I'm going to ask you as we get some questions uh, in, loaded up in the online queue. Um, if you in the audience here have questions, uh, be ready to raise your hand. I will call on uh, Susie and Andrew in just a few minutes to uh, be our mic marshals. We've got um, two microphones on either side. Um, they will assist you in uh, asking your question. But let's transition to the Q&A by talking about this National Week of Conversation. Great. Uh, indeed, the sixth annual uh, will be again this spring, and these days we're kicking it off with that Galvanizing America Talks event in partnership with USA Today uh, and others. Uh, so this is a showcase. It's a showcase of all the unbelievable work that people across the Listen First Coalition and this growing bridging movement are doing. So partners will be doing what they do um, across that week. It's a great opportunity to kind of get exposed to conversations across difference. Um, I, I tell you what, what I'm finding again and again, and we talked about using some of the free intelligent conversations over dinner. One of the questions is, is what have you uh, heard recently that's kind of stuck with you? And for me, it was patience is perseverance. Um, so in that vein, uh, it's really hard, y'all. It's really hard for any of us um, to be willing to, to sit down and expose ourselves to what too many of us, you mentioned campus climate, have found to be uh, a really kind of uncomfortable situation. You know, many folks, especially conservatives these days, feel attacked, judged, condescended upon. Who wants to show up for that? So we've really scarred each other on the idea of coming together uh, in conversation. But there's some easy entry points during National Week of Conversation put on by all of our partners, as well as America Talks as one galvanizing event to get thousands of Americans taking that first step, that entry point. Those will all be on americatalks.us to stay apprised of the movement and all of the opportunities offered by our coalition partners between now and then and beyond. You can go to listenfirstproject.org and sign the Listen First Pledge. Really straightforward. I will listen first to understand. And I fall short every day, but we're going to do our best to listen first to understand. Do that. And then I also want to be very accessible you know, to you all who believe in this mission um, and who want to be a part of it, who want to be part of that change, part of turning down the heat and finding a way forward together. So feel free to email me, Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E, -E, at listenfirstproject.org. 
one of the most accessible speakers I've ever invited to campus. I'm like, Pierce, you must be getting emails from everyone every day. It's, it's interesting how so many people want to kind of close themselves off. This is a person who's asking for you to contact him and to open up. So um, I, I have a few more, I have many more questions I would love to ask you, and my students have many more questions as well. Um, but I think we want to open it up to the audience uh, as we begin our Q&A. Um, again, I'd like to welcome our virtual audience at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Uh, again, one of the earliest and largest lifelong learning programs of the country for adults 50 years and older. Um, so let's first take a question from the audience in-house, if Susie and Andrew can take one of those microphones on each side of uh, the room here. Looks like we have a question, um, Susie, way in the back. Uh, is that, yes, kind of in the middle. We'll take the question from uh, both students and community members. So it looks like this is a question from a student. I have an also CPC intern. Um, my question. Gina, I'm sorry. Can you your mic was off. For yeah, a little okay. Bit for I got you. Uh, Gina Casenza, CPC intern and Com 337 student. Um, my question is: How did you overcome any bias to be able to listen to the other side, and how has that changed your outlook on this country as a whole? I'm working on it. <laughs> right. I'm not even going to pretend with y'all that uh, that I do a great job practicing what I preach, but but I will say that as I've tried to um, have some level of integrity um, in the, the mission that I'm fording, uh, one thing it's done is, uh, it, it is, is really wipe away any stridence or conviction I had on most issues. Because once you understand where people are coming from, even on diametrically opposed issues, like, well, darn, I can kind of see that and, and argue from various positions. Uh, so it's certainly complicated my own thinking on some of the national issues. It, it's given me a window as I meet Americans unlike myself uh, into the experiences and the values that I may never agree with them. I may still think they're wildly misguided, but I kind of get that. Mm -hmm. I kind of have an understanding of where they're coming from. So, I, you know, if anybody says I have overcome my bias, they're lying mm -hmm. because <laughs> we all have these biases and these backgrounds. Uh, but simply opening myself up, pushing myself, making myself really uncomfortable. Like, I can't stress this enough. I do not have this figured out, <laughs> right? But making myself uncomfortable, talking to folks I wouldn't usually talk to um, has just broadened my perspective in a way that I think is really helpful. Um, just as I navigate the world. Yeah, and I think um, for those of you who, are, who uh, were here for Paul Kane's talk, the uh, congressional reporter who was on the Capitol on January 6th, uh, 2021, I remember we were sitting in the, talking in the back of this room as we were getting ready to leave, and he was telling my students, take as many electives as you can, because once you, I don't think we talked about this, mm. once, once you graduate, there are no more electives. There are, there are no more ways to sort of challenge yourself to, other than coming to national agenda, okay, free advertisement, <laughs> um, to really challenge yourself to think about things in new ways, and I think that's absolutely right. So one thing that I would say to those college students who are asking what can we do is to take courses outside of your field, to take courses where you might not understand it, to be just genuinely intellectually curious about what is going on around you. And there's something profoundly more satisfying and optimistic about being curious than being solidly familiar with your own beliefs. Like there's something about like, it, it sort of frees up like, oh, I don't have to be diligently this kind of conservative or this kind of liberal or this kind of pro-choice or pro whatever it is. It's like, I can be kind of like, oh, okay, that's your opinion. Tell me more about that. It's empowering, right? It really it's empowering. is. Like be an individual. Don't just be an, you know, robot within whatever tribe uh, you're, you find yourself most often a part of. And perhaps some people are trying to further entrench you in whatever that tribe is. Be an individual. Be curious. This is going back a little bit. Some of my um, older friends in the audience will, will know what I'm talking about, but Larry King had a great quote, you know, quintessential prominent talk show host. He said, I never learned anything by talking. <laughs> 
That's great. All right, let's open it up to another question from the audience. Uh, Andrew, it looks like we've got one right kind of in the smack dab in the middle here. And I'm seeing we have questions coming in from our Osher Lifelong Learning Institute folks, so we'll get to them after we have a few questions from our in-house audience. Hi, Pierce, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name's Jeff, I'm a civil discourse uh, student leader with the Biden Institute. Awesome. Um, I wanted to ask you for more clarification on what you meant by don't talk about truth or facts. Um, I guess it seems to me that if we wanna make progress on any important social issue, we need to have an, like sort of a shared understanding of what the problem is. And sort of as an example, if we were both in a conversation trying to talk about how to fix polarization in our country and I disagree that it was a problem. I, I'd assume you'd appeal to many of the statistics you brought up earlier in the conversation to sort of lay the groundwork of, of facts that we can then use as a launching point to solve the problem, so. Yeah. Great thank, question, thank you. Thank you for that pushback, Jeff, and, and the <laughs> opportunity to, to say more. Um, when I said, you know, don't talk about facts and truth, uh, I was thinking about that one-on-one -on -one conversation, right, where, where it's you and another human being. Everything Jeff said is so true. How on earth? And this, uh, this is one of the things that has struck me um, in some of the events of the last couple years is I knew, like, we're demonizing each other, right? I got that. I got that we think each other's a threat. What I didn't fully comprehend, and depending on your side, you can, like, pretend I'm thinking whatever. I'm not going to tell you which things I'm thinking about. But... Uh, we're living on like different universes in terms of facts and what I humbly might consider truth. Um, for Republic the record, I do oh. believe there's truth. I'm not, you know. Book title, Republicans are from Mars, Democrats are from Venus. There you go, <laughs> there you go. Um, and that is terrifying. I mean, it, Jeff, you're so right. How on earth do we do this thing I talk about, find a way forward together if we can't even agree on basic facts? We gotta get there, but based on the backfire effects I talked about, going at people with that facts and truth is going to do the opposite of what you want it to do. And you're absolutely right in your point about me. If, if, if you were like, Pierce, it's not a problem. No, it is a problem. Let me tell you about the feeling thermometer. I would totally go there because it's who I am. And guess what? It wouldn't work. You would mm -hmm. dig in and say, okay, well, now I'm being attacked. Now I feel stupid. Now you're just condescending me and I'm going to dig in further. So it is quite the conundrum. I know this is an unsatisfactory answer because you're right. We've got to get to truth. We can't live and occupy this same space, lines on a map, as I like to say. If nothing else, we are stuck between some lines on a map. We've got to get to a common understanding, but there's some steps before that that are humanity and listening or else we might as well forget getting to a shared truth. So I want to be clear. Truth matters. Mm -hmm. Facts matter. But nobody cares about your truth or your facts until they believe that you respect them. Absolutely. They believe that you see them as belonging. Absolutely. There's a, a famous study um, uh, in political science at w which looked at uh, Republicans' response to um, the arguments about WMDs being found in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And that when people were uh, primed with an explanation of why WMDs were not exactly in Iraq to begin with, which was the justification for going to war, they dug their heels in even more and were like, yes, there were, yes, there were. And so much of politics, I think that we, we like to think of ourselves as, as evolved, rational, rational <laughs> human beings who, uh, <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> and so much of it is just emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. My students are all, I can see them looking at me <laughs> like now, they're reading uh, Jonathan Haidt's yep. The Righteous Mind, which is a great book about how so much of what we do when it comes to political decision making is emotional. It's about reacting in the moment. Um, the elephant and the rider. The elephant and the rider. Look at them, yeah, they're all like, yes. <laughs> you better nod, she's like. <laughs> so um, I, I do want to, uh, we do have some questions from our online uh, audience. So I'd like to um, go ahead and open it up. It looks like we can have a question that's gonna come up on the screen here from our online audience at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. How can local communities encourage conversation across differences? Thanks for the question, Diane. Um, 
I would go to, and this isn't even like a shameless plug because I'm pointing you to everybody else, um, but on listenfirstproject.org, if you click on the coalition, you're going to see a number of different groups that, that do terrific work. Some of them are geographically based, um, others like Brave Angels, Living Room Conversations, uh, do work all over the country, have methodologies that you can take in the case of living room conversations and do yourself with a couple friends in your Bible study, in your book club, whatever. Um, so I, I, you know, major hat tip, we used some of their prompts earlier uh, in class to my friends at Living Room Conversations. There's a whole spectrum, I went through it a little bit, the different ways that partners engage folks in local communities. So uh, as, as the very first step, I would send you uh, to Living Room Conversations. They've got literally over 100 guides on all sorts of different topics. Print one off and do it. Like, if you want to get all trained up, knock yourself out. But I'm a big fan, and this, this doesn't work if we've all got to get, like, facilitator training, right? We just need to exist as humans. And I gave you three tips. I really think they work. Um, I don't think they work. I know they work. What we've seen time and time again is Have you getting, done the research, though, to know that Yes, we have. Um, I, I cut that because I didn't want give, give to get you guys with too much stuff. Uh, but they, uh, the, they work. Uh, and when, we, when folks have that experience, whether it's your own that you do yourself, it's not hard, I promise. Um, or whether it's a more organized event like we do with America Talks or like we do with Meeting of America. When folks come to the table, they're blown away. I told you, they're more hopeful. They say, oh my gosh, this, this can happen. And boy, was it interesting. But we're all kind of scared to come to the table. So yeah, the, Diane, uh, I, would, I would point you to Living Room Conversations. Print one out if you want to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. I would point you to Brave Angels. They've got alliances in all 50 states now. Um, and a number of other organizations that you'll find on the Listen First Coalition webpage that have terrific tools um, for you to leverage in your community. Um, and again, just to reiterate, go for it. Do it yourself. Like, I love my 500 partners, but if we're relying on the members who are, like, actually attached and really engaged, we're not going to get there. We've got to have people out there doing it on your own volition, in your own spaces, and you can. And I think it's, you're, you, you underestimate how simple it is to just print off this moderated conversation guide from, for example, Living Room Conversations. And I've had discussions with my students about abortion, about gun control and gun rights, and do we devolve into some sort of crazy, like, argument? No, because honestly, most of us are curious about other people's perspectives, and um, it's, it's really freeing mm -hmm. to sort of say, I'm curious why you feel that way. Um, I, I do want to get to, it looks like we don't have any more questions from the Osher Life and Learning Institute, although there are a few minutes left if you do have a question that you want to direct to us. But um, I often describe to my students that the way that I came to this space in terms of wanting to understand different perspectives was having parents from totally different ends of the ideological political spectrum. Um, I don't think we got to talk about this too much, mm -hmm. but, but uh, to have you know, um, a, a one parent who lives in um, a, a community in Florida that watches you know, Fox News, and then one parent who li literally moved to Canada um, when George W. Bush was elected. Um, and of course, they're, I joke they're divorced. Um, that should be obvious. Um, but like, how do we get that way? How do we get so divided to the point where we can't see each other as fellow human beings? And I think that there's, there's a real value to this just genuine curiosity mm -hmm. for people who disagree with you and who um, you just kind of want to hear where they're coming from. So it looks like we have one more question from um, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute folks. So let's go ahead and pull that up on the slide now that we have uh, another moment to hear from them. So what do you think the impact of race and gender may have in being able to engage people who may have, ha may have different views? Do you have suggestions for how that might be considered? Can you help me out? Considered an opening a, here we go, screen number two, hopefully. Or just go back, we can answer the first question about race and gender. Technology, what are you gonna do? <laughs> well, maybe you can go ahead and sure. answer that first question. Sure. Um, you know, those are certainly some of the most salient and I mean, just to be really practical, visually obvious 
chasms or differences um, considered in opening a conversation um, that, uh, that we have uh, mm-hmm. in, in, this, in this diverse population. I mean, I, I, am, I am not a scholar of race and gender issues, but, but, you know, as you heard me say, all different backgrounds and beliefs, that's who we need as part of the conversation. Every one of our fellow Americans of any such race, gender, disposition, whatever it may be, um, have to be there. I, I definitely think, um, you know, going right at some of those uh, issues. We talked earlier in, in the class about one way to connect with respect is naming differences, right? Not shying away from them. You, you mentioned, Dr. Hoffman, you know, how empowering it is to be curious and be that individual person. Uh, similarly, it's empowering to not shy away and say, oh, you're this kind of person. I don't want to uh, say the wrong thing. Oh, you're that kind of person. Let's just say, look, I'm a this you're that. Obviously, we're all going to be respectful, but just, you know, making it uh, that kind of welcoming, conducive, secure environment that these things are not taboo. They don't have to be, right? We always want to be respectful. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but when we are suspending judgment and extending grace, we don't need to concern ourselves with whether we're using, you know, the, the, the most politically correct term that might have changed in the last seven minutes, we can just have a conversation. We can just be humans. Um, and I certainly think, Jennifer, that, that, that ensuring that we are crossing lines of difference in terms of race, in terms of gender, is critically important. And don't shy away from what those differences mean. Be curious. We keep saying the same thing. But I mean, truly, once you're in that space, and, and one thing I've always, I've noticed, like I'm a huge fan of those three tips, like write them down, go for it. But what I've realized over time is it almost doesn't matter what specific tips you use. Living room conversations, you'll find, has six. You know, some people have 10. But when you ground the conversation, as you intimated, in that, that tone Everybody just kind of like gets what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. If you ask them 30 minutes later, what were the tips? Hell if I know. Mm -hmm. But I understood that we weren't going to (laughs) do what we do on social media. I understood that we aren't going to do what we see on cable news. We're going to have a respectful conversation in which we are listening with curiosity. We're suspending judgment and extending grace. That's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's it's it's um, having done uh, some research over the last semester using living room conversations as a guide, it, you're right, you go through these kind of ground rules, but once you get over that, people are just kind of like, it's almost like people are like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I don't have to defend my point of view. I don't have to be ideological. I could just be like, yeah, what do you think about that? Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's really empowering. So um, I do want to uh, wrap things up. I want to thank um, Andrew and Susie for being our mic marshals here in the room. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs>